the future of yeah. music is not it doesn't go one way it, it's not gonna be you know periphery samples with uh periphery patches you know yeah um because you know there's still bands that want to record live and they want nice live rooms and you know they want strings and pianos and stuff like that and you know they want to sound like like a real band and Welcome to the Production Masters Podcast, the philosophies and techniques behind making music according to the Masters of Music Production. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Production Masters Podcast. My name's Owen Gillette from Ice Cocoon and ProductionMasters.net. Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to say a massive thanks to everybody who's watched all the Bobcats videos. There will be more to come in the future and more videos in general coming up. It's been really fantastic getting a lot of new subscribers to the podcast on YouTube as well. It's really awesome, so thanks everyone. My guest today is a producer, mix and mastering engineer whose name is Jamie Gomez Arellano. He works out of an absolutely gorgeous studio in Woburn, Bedfordshire called Orgon Studios. Um, recently, he's produced Orange Goblin, and fairly recently before that, he's done the last two Paradise Lost albums, and also he's worked with Ghost and Ulva, amongst other bands. He recently remixed and remastered Believe in Nothing by Paradise Lost and remastered Host for the release coming out this month. His way of doing things is a bit more of an old-school approach, where he loves his tape machines and loves getting the sound right at the source. So this is a discussion I really enjoyed, being that they are all the things that I really love as well. Um, steering away from drum editing and all that stuff. Um, so I really enjoyed this interview and I hope you guys do too, obviously. Just before we start, I want to apologize for the fact that there's a few delays of my voice that ended up in his mic that I couldn't edit out. I spent about three hours trying to edit them all out. I guess it might be something to do with the delay difference between Australia and England. And then he recorded his voice onto an iPhone, actually, which sounded much better than my Skype source. I hope it's not too distracting from the interview. As some of you will know, you can like and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. And also, you can find it at iTunes, at Stitcher Radio at productionmasters.net, the official site, and also I upload to CastBox, which is for Android users. So let's get into the interview. Here it is. This is Mr. Jamie Gomez Arellano. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another Production Masters podcast. Today, my very special guest on the line is Mr. Jamie Gomez. How are you this evening, sir? Uh, very well, Owen. Thank you very much for having me as part of your show. Uh, it's very nice to, to meet you. Yeah, you're very welcome. The pleasure is mine. So starting out, um, I already heard a few bits and pieces on the URM podcast interview, but you actually started as a mastering engineer, is that right? I mean, in terms of actually being, um, uh, uh, you know, once you trained and all that, you actually started as a mastering guy, is that true? Yeah, that is, that is right, actually. Um, it was just one of those things that when <clears throat> when I started um, kind of learning more about um, audio and record production, um, I was really kind of fascinated by it. You know, like people say, like, it's kind of a bit of a dark art and all this stuff. And I just I just found it really interesting to, you know, it's like, oh, so what, what, what what's this mastering thing? So I, I did a lot of research on it and started doing it. Um, and then actually, yeah, like the organ studios used to be actually organ mastering. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it kind of started like the other way around, but there you go. When you started out doing that, um, what was your monitoring setup like? Or like, what was your setup like when you first started that? Because was it the studio that you're in now? No, no, no. It's just ages ago. Um, I started mastering stuff in my bedroom. Um, I had, um, I think the first, the first bit of proper equipment I bought was a, a Manly Massive Passive. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I think like my first kind of mastering setup was my my Lavery Blue converters. Yeah. And I had a, a actually an SSL kind of copy clone thing. Um, 
that a really good engineer made for me and we've modified it about three times so it's a really really cool comp i had that i had the massive passive and then i had a pair of car techs which are like a uh, handmade kind of british pull techs oh uh, yeah sure um and then my monitoring, I mean, like when I was kind of still doing stuff at home, I was actually using um, Mackie 624s, which are not mastering speakers, but yeah. it is what you're yeah. used to. So, you know, I found a way of just working with them and just checking in different systems at home. I would check on headphones and and uh, lots of different things, lots of different playback devices before I would commit to anything. But then... Uh, like when I actually started, like like when I actually had some premises and, and started like an actual business, yeah. Um, I got a pair of Barefoot Sound uh, monitors, which I think I must have been one of the very first people to get them in the UK because I had them for nearly like I guess about nine years now. So that's the Micromain Twenty Sevens. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they. I've never got to hear what they sound like, but I've, I'm totally curious. I'm sure they must be very impressive. They are. I think they're. I think they. The main. The main thing for me is that they. They translate very well. Yeah. I think overall. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the main thing. They have a lot of detail too. Um, I'm a big fan. I think you know. I. I think they really. They really changed my the way I work. Um, because obviously, you know, going from like Mackies to, to the Barefoots was a big jump. And it was like I could hear a lot, you know, more frequencies and everything was a bit clearer, like a lot clearer, actually. And and yeah, I just, I'll just never change them. You know, I keep on getting friends and people that work, you know, other producers and stuff telling me, oh, you have to try these new speakers. You have to try these new monitors. And, and I'm like, actually, I'm all right with my Barefoots. Like, they just work for me, so... No thanks. But yeah, I totally. I think they work for quite a few people, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually I was actually talking to uh, a while ago to Andy Sneep, and who's another British producer. I mean, yeah. he's he's been doing it for a long time, and he's excellent. Yeah. Um, and we get along, and I keep on telling him, like, dude, you need to. I mean, I kept on telling him years ago, you need to move on from the from those Genelex you've been using. And it's like, nah, it's it's what you're used to, and I'm never gonna change my Genelex. So, there's probably I kind of feel the same way, kind of like I don't really want to. I don't really want to change my monitors because I think they work for me, unless you know someone, or some kind of new technology that really changes everything comes out. I think I'm pretty happy with my barefoot. Yeah, well, there's probably some merit to wanting to stay with the same speakers because the familiarity of knowing what you're hearing is worth probably almost the most isn't it really really yeah i mean that's that's what you pay for i mean for me it's just you know the detail and the and the way they translate that's the that's my main thing they to me i'm so used to them now i i just i really can't see myself changing anytime soon or anytime at all <laughs> awesome i don't know awesome. yeah so, so when you were doing i've got to think of what i'm saying here um with did did doing a lot of lisp because presumably you would have started out doing a lot of listening when it was you were learning mastering do you think all the early work on concentrating on mastering gave you a perspective that was important to start with when you started doing actual production if you know what i'm saying yeah um like yeah i mean like, it's it's uh, obviously like mastering is such a different such a different be uh, beast to mixing and, and production just recording um mm. so yeah of course of course he had a like a massive a massive um impact on the way i work because i i've gotten used to mixing and mastering at the same time so all oh, right you know well, like, i was going to ask you about that yeah yeah, yeah so what I do, what I do is, um, you know, I start, I start kind of mixing on Pro Tools, then, uh, then I start throwing things on on my SSL, um, and then I kind of mix. But you know, I I do use plugins and I do use digital. I'm not, you know, I'm not Steve Albini. I like digital too, even though I really like analog. 
Um, yeah. and, uh, and then, yeah, when I'm kind of getting to a point where I'm kind of really liking the mix, then I, I start throwing things in the, in the, in the mix bus of the, of the desk. And, and then, yeah, it kind of ends up being kind of mastered. Um, and you know, like some mix, I mean, uh, it's kind of changed over the years. Like now I don't really do that much to the mixes, um, in the master bus anymore. Yeah. I just kind of mix and mix and mix until, until I feel like, uh, I get what I want. But, uh, to be fair, man, there, there is a really cool thing about throwing a mix into, into some outboard or like some processing doesn't have to be outboard but you know into some kind of i don't know eqs and stuff and sometimes you can completely change the sound of a mix and give it like a completely different vibe so i wouldn't say that either of the workflows are correct or incorrect i think they're both different yeah sure so so when you get to like with your more recent productions because i guess you've probably you know hit your stride with how you work i'm guessing um with the more recent productions is there actually a separate mastering process or is there like when you do you do all your mixing and then pull them all in and then there's really not much to do for the quote-unquote mastering stage or yeah that's kind of <clears throat> that's kind of what's been happening more and more in the last few years like i just mm -hmm. i mean it really depends on the mix because it's kind of weird to describe, like sometimes I mix with the master in mind and sometimes I just mix, if that makes any sense. So like I would leave, if I'm kind of mixing with, um, with the mastering in mind, like, you know, like sometimes I would leave, say like the, like the low end and the top end, you know, I'm not going to push anything too hard in the mix because I already got in my mind what I've gonna what I'm gonna use for the to like give it that extra bottom end and that extra top end uh yeah. in in the in the mix bus rather than you know out of the actual individual parts. Um but yeah it it I mean it it changes every time to be honest. Like I don't really I really don't have a I'm really not one of these kind of like template kind of you know safe settings kind of guy. Yeah, um, you can t you can tell that listening to your work. I mean, just between the between the the last two Paradise Lost albums that you recorded, like they sound actually really quite different. Uh, like, which is yeah. which is cool. It's not like a it's a scenario where some people it would sound almost the same. Like, a, you know, there's you can tell there's not a a formula of uh, like a sonic formula. It's it's obviously a more of an intuitive process or like a you know whatever your process is. So. Yeah, that's I mean, cool. like, uh, I think that's 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 a pretty cool example, um, because I mean, in terms of production, we like both records were really different, and I discussed that with the guys the new album, and and you know, we we all wanted just like a kind of more gnarly, like kind of really raw sounding record, um, because I don't know, that's kind of the the way it was written, you know, like Greg, Greg wanted to do like a like a doom record, and yeah. I was well I don't I don't I don't want like you know like this kind of super nice kind of heavy sounding guitars and this like kind of really kind of nice drums you know like the drums I mean I, I love everything production wise on that record but I think um it's really raw like really roomy drums and very natural sounding and like guitars I use some some pedals and some if you know that I think most people in probably in the, in the kind of metal production don't really use at all, and you know, just playing playing with things or uh, around with things to get the yeah what I really want, really. Yeah, well, that's right. The gu the guitars have got more bite or something than uh, yeah, they're not. Which is, I guess, it's what's appropriate for the for the music. It allows it to yeah be more of what it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's but what I always focused on, I, like my entire career is like I I don't want to be one of these people that just have they just have a sound because Andy Wallace didn't have a sound, Brendan O'Brien kind of has a sound now, but you know uh, they work with so many different styles and they did so many different 
types of kind of production. Yeah. And that's yeah. what and that's what I find interesting. You know, I don't want to be one of these kind of factory people where, you know, I have my okay, we're using this drum kit with this skins and I already know which mics I'm gonna use and and this guitar amp and this cab and this mic on the guitar. you know, I, I don't like that. I think that yeah, sure it will make my work easier. I probably get, you know, more clients come in i don't know even though i'm like super booked up all the time but uh i don't know i just i i just find that a bit boring and i think you know i, I also work with um you know I, I i just don't do like one type of kind of bands i work with like variety of of genres in and you know i i just like to mix it up really Definitely. Um, I think the heavier genres are ones where <clears throat> there's a it's there's it's easy for engineers to start becoming a, a production line as well. Like they have can have a process and go through just and then everything sounds the same. I mean, I know it, probably everybody's saying that these days as well. That um, I mean, certainly at this like at the um, more amateur level, a lot of recordings are all definitely sound like that. But uh, um, I wanted to talk to you about your recording philosophy because obviously it is is quite different to that. And um, um, what am I saying? Uh, uh, there's that mental blank that I get at least once a podcast. Um, <laughs> no, it's <is laughs> fine. We all get them. Um, yeah, you can tell that your ethos is more about spending more time and I'm, I've heard you say this before as well, that you'd rather spend time making the drums sound awesome before like any mics are even out. Like uh, you'd rather get the sound from the recording, not the sound from the mix, I guess, if you want to call it that or from the, the extra processing afterwards. That's super important, you know, like, uh, particularly, uh, I mean, like, to, uh, I think the idea is to create, to create something unique, you know, like I, I see like how many how many bands have, you know, this this formula that sounds really good, you know, like the the easy drummer easy drummer thing with the whatever samples they use and the whatever kind of guitar simulator they use that is usually like a 5150 amp emulation. And you know that stuff sounds really good inverted commas for me, uh, but it's just totally like unexciting and boring, you know, and plastic and so um, I'm really not about that. I think then to do that, you have to start with, you know, with pre-production with the band and working on on the arrangements of the songs and the songs themselves and then moving on to what people are going to play and which instruments actually suit the the band um, yeah. rather than just yeah. running everything through the same preset. I guess it helps that uh, you've got a you've accumulated a, a nice collection of gear as well so that there are some options because I, I guess that might be the limitation for <clears throat> some studios as well if they've only got one good amp and one good drum kit <laughs> it you know it ends up encouraging the process of things continuing to be the same maybe but uh, I know you've got a pretty you've uh, accumulated a good collection of amps and drums and stuff haven't you yeah, I mean, and I'll I'll keep on buying more if I can because that's that's better spend money than I think than outboard and and preamps and stuff like that. If you yeah, if you get like a if you get a drum that sounds really good, um, you know, you can get most drums to sound good. I think a lot of people don't know how to tune them or like you know or like you can you can make a a great you can get a great guitar sound with just a fifty seven. You know, in a normal, in a decent preamp. You know, so I think yeah, the source. I mean, the, I'm more interested in the source than than actually how am I gonna mess it up in the mix with like samples and you know like harmonic processors and all this kind of stuff. You know, I just kind of rather just get it. I mean, it doesn't always work because you start you know you start adding more instruments. Like you record your drums and then you start adding more instruments and then. Okay, like your your kick drum could have been a bit more clicky or have more snap. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't know that because you hadn't been you hadn't tracked the guitars before, kind of thing. So yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, and 
I feel like there's almost a bit of conventional wisdom in the recording culture at the moment where people might say if someone was starting out and they had this kind of philosophy that you've got, they might say, oh, well, you've got to do this to get clients or this is what you need to do for this type of music. But obviously you've uh, just decided this is what actually is exciting and it's what how you see music being uh, produced and that type of thing. So um, what I'm curious about is who was the first big client that you had where you took this approach and that it worked and you were like, wow, that's, if there was that moment where you went, wow, this is actually something really cool. Like, uh, cause that's like another step, isn't it? To take all of that and make it work in a, like a, a I guess a worldwide context. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think because the, the first few kind of bands that I work with were actually like the kind of London, like experimental avant-garde rock, art rock kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I kind of listened to a lot of 70s music myself. I kind of grew up with like 70s rock stuff a lot and 80s stuff and right. 90s stuff. Yep. Um, so I already had like a pretty clear idea. I think that I didn't just want to sound like, you know, that kind of... I think at one point when I was kind of more like more like still learning, you know, like I, I would listen to like Snip Records and go like, holy shit, this sounds great. But on the other hand, you know, I would listen to something that um, Steve Albini had been working on and go like, yeah, that's that's great, too. You know? Yeah. Um, so I'm not really sure, like, where you go from that. And then I, I guess like the the the, me, the one album that I, I really discussed the production at length before we started doing anything was the first Ghost album. Right. Yep. Yep. I had a... Um, I had a meeting with uh with Tobias. Um we met in uh before a, a repugnant show, which is his other band in, in London. He was playing a festival and I met one of the old bandmates. Um and we just had a chat about like um you know how how do we see the, the sound of this album and, and we uh both me and Tobias liked a lot of the same stuff, uh, production wise for it. I, you know, I was kind of thinking more like Blue Oyster Cult kind of, yeah, kind of sound in some stuff, and you know, just looking at kind of really seventies kind of dry sound, like dry drum sound, but still pretty punchy. Like you know, give it more of a modern kind of edge. Yeah, that makes sense. And I said that's that like a, it's like um, yeah, I'd say that's um, a pretty kind of like vintage modern, if you can call it, um, album. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think that was probably the. I mean, even though I worked in a few, like quite a few other things before, I think that was the album where, uh, I guess you know, I kind of made my sound, which is no sound. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> well, or I mean that uh, I'm. Was that probably one of the f one of the first projects where after that, you uh, your career took a different turn after that, or? Yeah, it definitely did. Yeah, I mean that. That really helped a lot, to be honest. Um, yeah, before that, you know, I was still mainly working with a uh, with local bands, and but you know, like some really cool local bands, um, and um, yeah, doing a lot of that kind of you know that kind of London crazy kind of avant garde prog rock kind of thing. Right, I worked with a lot right. of those bands like Guapo and. Did a bunch of mastering for some European bands as well, and that's kind of how I, how I landed on Over afterwards. But I think that was after Ghost, just after. What did you do with Over? Uh, we recorded a lot of uh, Wars of the Roses in my studio. Oh really? Oh wow! I didn't realize yeah. that. Wow. And uh, wow. then, and then after that, I've I've mastered every release, apart from the very last one. Ah, oh, awesome. Oh, did you did you remaster Perdition City? Oh, I can't remember. I think I did. That was. I'm pretty sure I did. It's the it's yeah, the one I with a kind of cream and like mostly it's like a blue blue on the cover. It came from it was from like ninety nine two thousand. No, I, I know I know the record very well. Um, oh right. I just can't remember if I. I I'm pretty sure it was me. Because I remember, uh, I remember reading something when they um, had it remastered. I think maybe it was when they were putting it out on vinyl. 
uh, and I think it's, it's said in the write up it got to, sent to tape to warm it up or to you know to give it yeah that would have been me because it sounds like I, I do <laughs> I do a lot of that stuff actually I I, I want to check actually but I'll, I'll check later I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I've done mm, I can't remember I, I mean I've done so many things with them now and you know we're quite pally as well and yeah and yeah. obviously like so many I, I master I still master a lot of stuff and it's kind of Okay. You know, my memory isn't the greatest either. So, how, um, so how many on just like a if on average, how many projects would you do mastering for a week? It could go from from zero to maybe I don't know. On a really busy week, could be like ten, fifteen. Fifteen albums. Yeah because I do a lot of remastering for vinyl that I don't get a lot of credit for because it's um, I do a lot of back catalog stuff for some companies right? Uh, where they basically put out stuff that wasn't out on vinyl before and <clears throat> they've worked, I do a lot of that. Worked, so They've worked out that they can trust you to do it properly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and obviously I have a, I have a pretty good relationship with this, with these companies and, um, yeah, I mean, I, it depends. Like, you know, sometimes it can be like I do, like I master like three albums in, in a month and then there'll be other months where I'll do like, I don't know, like 20, 30, you know, depending on how many releases, de depending on the clients as well and what's going on, you know, because some some of the back catalog stuff that goes into vinyl, you know, it's not like, a, it's not something that takes me a whole day to do one one release, you know, I can... I can work them. I can do maybe what, uh, two or three, you know, in a day. Well, wow. um, that's because you know they're already they already been mastered, and so you know you just don't wanna. I just wanna make sure that they're gonna translate well in the cutting life, more than anything. I'm not, you know, I, I wanna respect what was done with the record, and yeah. if there's yeah. any kind of correction that I could do, you know, if there's like uh, I do a lot of really old stuff as well like back like you know like 60s and 70s stuff back catalog and like okay cool. radio broadcasts okay. and stuff like that you know concerts that have been only on tv but they've never been out on vinyl and stuff like that so if there's like any glitches from the broadcast or anything like that then of course i kind of clean that up and obviously obviously try to to improve everything but still respecting what's uh what the what it was intended by the original producer and mixing and mastering engineers do you find that uh, some amount of the re remastering is a, a case of doing something different with the bottom end yeah i mean especially especially with the yeah i mean the bottom end's got it's gotten bigger and bigger mm, you know yeah. um but it really depends you know because sometimes Sometimes you wanna you wanna start pulling some of those lows out of a mix, and you realize there's no lows, <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing to pull. <laughs> um, so you know you kind of or or if you start like adding like maybe using like harmonics processors to, or even like bounce it on tape just to see what comes out and maybe get a bit more bottom end. Sometimes it does work, and but sometimes you just you're just pulling stuff that doesn't sound good. So yeah. But yeah, ma mainly, yeah, I mean, I think the bottom end and I think obviously with, with a lot of the, of the of the 90s, you know, like mid 90s to like mid 2000s kind of stuff, like a lot of it sounds really kind of crispy and thin and digital and horrible. So definitely, yeah, that kind of stuff. I like I like putting it on tape, you know, and just kind of try and make it sound a little bit more alive. Yeah. Well, what sort of what sort of tape are you running it to what type of what size machine or whatever like is it a half inch tape or no i've got a i've got a quarter inch mm -hmm. um i've got a studer a80 right. mark 2 yeah that works like a dream and she's a very good girl never gives me much grief to be honest um the 24 track uh, is a lot more um 
complicated to maintain and more expensive and yeah of course there's a yeah. lot more things that can go wrong with 24 channels and two <laughs> yes uh, but uh yeah i used the the a80 and i mean from what the my tech tells me uh there is really no difference between apparently he he tells me that you know, like the more width you have on the tape and that the better it sounds and blah, blah. He tells me that's bullshit. Is that right? That's what he says. I mean, he's, this guy used to be the tech for Olympic Studios back in the 70s. So right. if there's someone that knows about tape, it's that guy. So sure, <laughs> I kind of believe and, you know, I've never had the opportunity to to listen to two machines back to back. And if you do... And you hear a difference, you know, it could be that the, the, the alignment is different in both machines. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't really know. Um, so it's, is it more, I think like, sorry. Yeah. What, this, right. what this guy says is that basically people talk a lot of shit about tape. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and everything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, you know, but apparently with tape, um, like it, it's really bad. Like he just says he he reads some stuff online that he just he just wants to cry because he's so so bullshit. That doesn't surprise me because it's actually it's almost esoteric how a tape machine works. It's almost a bit mysterious to really understand. Um, so with I mean digital recording and all that technology seems to be a little bit more black and white to understand, even though it's probably not either. But that's interesting if you're saying so it's is it more about the quality of the machine and the quality of the tape and it being aligned than the, the width or you know the size of the tape is that what you mean yeah well that's um i mean to me to me my 24 track and my two tracks sound amazing um but um i was telling i was telling clive um the the guy who does my that services my machines yeah like yeah. i want to i want to get a 16 a 16 track block because um there's this other really great producer in america randall dunn we're like really good pen pals and and he loves that those 16 track um studers he tells me they sound amazing so i was telling clive like look i really want to get one of these things for the two inch and machine for the two inch and he was like don't bother like there's no difference <laughs> and then uh and then, you know, it's one of those things, like I, I messaged uh, Randall and told him about it, like, hey, like Clive is saying that there is no difference. He explained to me why, but you know, the tape stuff is like, it's quite complex to understand. Definitely, um, yeah. I mean, it's because we don't really learn it anymore. Uh, I mean, maybe for someone that work with a lot with tape, they will, they will know, probably like someone like Andy Sneap or Russ Russell, they will know because they used to work on tape a lot. They're proper engineers. Um, yeah. but I was like, yeah. I don't know, you lost me, dude. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but then I messaged Randall and he said, and he said like, look, uh, Clive is saying that definitely there's no difference. And then Randall replies to me like, oh, dude, definitely there's difference. So I don't know, man. <laughs> it's just one of those. I never felt the need to go and like go and buy like a, like a half inch, another machine for like, I don't know. I just really like the sound of mine. And it sounds sounds nothing like the plugins as well. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you ever experienced? Because, yeah. I, I mean, like there. Um, it just all depends on the tape you're using, the condition of your machine, and how you align it. So. Yep. Um, yep. And how you calibrate the whole thing, you know, like because you can, you can, yeah. So. I mean, the the some of those tape plugins, I think they're really good. And I do use some of them. I use the, I like the Slate stuff quite a bit. Um, sure, yeah. But it sounds, it sounds, I mean, it sounds good, that plugin, but it sounds so different to my, to my A80. It really does. Um, I was talking to Bob Katz a while back, and he's got a, an expensive rack mounted, I guess it's a, it's, well, it's a tape simulator, but I guess it's, it's a, like a tape machine, but it, there's no tape, if you know what I mean. And he said, yeah, I've seen, I've seen those. <clears throat> and, and I don't know how that, what that sounds like compared to tape itself, uh, things going on and off of tape, but he said that it, it sounds completely different to plugins as well, like it, that it's well, essentially superior to plugins as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, 
it's just a different sound you know i wouldn't say it sounds better you know i think for example the the slate uh, the slate uh, virtual tape machines has a sound and it's a cool sound uh, my tape machine has a sound and it's a different sound and it yeah. works better for different things you know um but i do i do really like the sound of my machines and i mean i think the plugins i think the plugins sound cool too but it's it's a different vibe i mean like to be fair like a lot of the digital stuff is sounding pretty good these days so but i still <laughs> You know, I still like mix sometimes, sometimes I mix like in Pro Tools and then sometimes I go like, why am I doing this? And then I go back, like mix on the desk and then I do, I don't know if it's just the way I work or what, but I do think it's, it's it sounds better to me to mix on analog. Okay. So, and uh, you end up summing your final mix through the desk as well? Yeah. I mean, like I, yeah, I mainly, yeah, I just kind of do just as much, as much as analog as you can do. So speaking of two inch tape with the, mm. with the last couple of Paradise Lost albums, were they recorded? Yeah. Were they, were they tracked to tape? Uh, I can't remember. Or even like just the the last one, Medusa. Was that? Do you remember? Did you track that to tape? Uh I I, I think we did. I can't remember. Okay. I really can't remember. Um, and what, last year was insane. It was literally <laughs> like one project after the other. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think it may have done. It may have been on tape. Yeah. So, uh, do you do you still feel like? you get something nice from doing the drums to tape 100% i mean yeah it's yep. like it's yeah it's it's a it's a different sound um 100% like um the the last i mean the most recent thing i've been working on that i worked on tape was orange goblin yep yeah and i would be in my obviously when i'm when i'm recording to tape um you have to be on input mode because if you're so basically, you have to hear what's feeding the machine because if you're hearing what's coming back from the tape, uh, the band will get a delay on their headphones because of the distance of the two heads. Yep, absolutely, yeah. So when you're on input mode, like when we're recording, you hear it, and then when I'm bouncing it to Pro Tools, when you hear back like the Repro head, it's 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 a very different sound. Like it's a. I mean, of course, it's the same, but like the bottom end just kind of thickens up by a lot. But I mean, by like, it's a it's a really noticeable difference, and it you know it rounds off some of those peaks, and you get like this kind of yeah. I mean, it kind of does what you'd imagine it to do, yeah. and it's and it's yeah. a and it's a really cool sound. I really like it for drums. Well, I can attest to what the end result sounds like, and that sounds awesome and fat and big. So. I guess we'll agree. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and the, but obviously, you know, again, like what a lot of people don't realize is that you, you have to work a bit differently because yep. if you're working to tape, you have to, you have to, I, you have to, I normally don't EQ or compress stuff when I'm recording, but with tape, you kind of have to, like especially EQ stuff that needs a bit more off top end. Yep. You want to probably yep. dial it in on the way in because, um, if you dial it in in the mix, you might start bringing too much tape hiss. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so you have to you have to work, think a little bit differently because you know, like I kind of got used to working in Pro Tools for a while and just recording digital. And then when I started recording on tape, I, I made you know not some uh, some terrible mistakes, but you know, I just thought like, oh okay, this, this should have been EQ'd on the way in a little bit because now I have lots of hiss coming out of this track. Yeah. So I, it's, it's yeah. cool. It's challenging because, you know, it's, it's just a different process. I really enjoy it. Totally. And with the, like, uh, if you can remember back to Medusa, were you, did you track the band playing all together, like, or just the drums by themselves? I'm curious if they sort of tracked like a live band playing together or... Is that part of your thing? Well, yeah, like normally, um, 
I like I like I like the band playing together, like uh, recording together all at all at the same time. Um, yeah. But I uh, with PL we didn't on Medusa because. I mean, like, Valtteri is a fucking machine. Like, I did not do one edit on the drums on that album. Yeah, I saw them. They toured down here uh, a couple of months ago. He's he's fantastic. He's, yeah, he's probably he's probably the best drummer they've ever had, actually. Like, I would just about say. <laughs> Especially considering yeah. how damn young he is, so. Yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. His oh, he's, he's, I know, I, sorry. Yeah, I didn't, it didn't go unnoticed. His timing is ridiculous. Like it just makes it look effortless. His timing is yeah. nuts. It's, yeah. it's <laughs> absolutely nuts. Like, so, um, it was kind of more of that kind of situation where we're like, well, like, uh, I mean, you have like, he's been, he's been rehearsing the demos to, because you know, like Greg kind of writes a song and then sends it to Nick. And then it's mainly, it's mainly, I mean, like Greg is kind of, he writes like, I mean, like 90% of the stuff. And then yeah. he'll discuss yeah. it with Nick, the singer. And then things, things kind of start evolving and changing. And then, then they settle on something and then they farm it out to, to the rest of the band. Um, and Valtteri, of course, he just sits there and he's a total perfectionist, that kid. Like he really is. Uh, so he'll just sit there and write every beat exactly the way he wants it, you know. So he already has all his drum fills kind of worked out. Unless there's something I go like, mm, this drum fill is not working here. Let's work. How how about you play this? And I just kind of, you know, because I'm a drummer, I'll kind of give him ideas. And, and he, he goes, oh, you mean like play this? Blah, 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 blah. You know, I, yeah, exactly that. So, oh, yeah, okay, cool. And he just does it. It's, it's, he's really talented. And he seems to have the vibe of he feels like a musician playing, not like a. Sometimes when you get session guys, they it's like they're doing everything correctly, but there's just no vibe. There's some other thing that's missing. You just go, this just I don't feel anything hearing this. But he still feels like he's doing it because you know his life depends on it, kind of thing, or that he's really loves it. You know, I get that feeling from it. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 quite lucky to 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 have grown not, not only listening to like metal drummers so he's you know for he's got a really good feel like with his left hand on the snare drum like he plays really cool ghost notes and mm. he, he's got some really kind of tasty kind of drum fills and stuff he's not one of those kind of machiney kind of session guys but but he is in a way you know like he just mm. i mean in the end we didn't i think we just decided like well there's no need to I'll just play you the backing tracks with the click. And if you just, if you got it all, I mean, he already sent me, he had already sent me um, tracks with drums. He's already kind of arranged for the songs. So it was all, you know, and we had some emails back and forth saying like, oh, maybe this drum fill is a bit too long or maybe this beat needs to change a little bit and then he'll do it. So we were, he was so prepared for the recording. Yeah. So... We decided, like, no, let's just, I'll just play you the backing tracks to the click because, I mean, it's no need. Um, that's kind of how we did that one. Yeah, and the snare drum sounds like so big and so fat on that recording as well. Um, do you, can you remember much about the drum or the skin or the how you got that drum sounding like that? Yeah, um, that was um, a Tama Gibraltar snare that I have yep. from the 90s. I think it's 18 ply birch, so it's a really thick shell. And it's 14 by 8. Um, and I used um, an Evans Heavyweight, which are very, very thick skins. Yeah, okay. Which give yeah. you a lot of okay. low end. And that was it. I think I normally, I usually... A lot of the time I used two mics on the snare, like on the top, on the snare top. So I think I had a 57 and a Bayer M201, which I quite like for that kind of fat, kind of um, really aggressive kind of, it sounds really cool, that microphone for like for like big snares. I really like it. Yeah. Um, and are they and are they like taped together, like right next to each other or are they like... Um, yeah. Um, I, I tape them together, yeah. Yeah, right. 
and then sometimes you know I'll compress I'll compress one a little bit on the way in um, if I'm getting something I'm really liking just a little uh, just something on the way in because of course I've you know I've got the other one not as a backup but you know I've got it there anyway so so yeah and just I and I think and also um, Valtteri he um, he plays he plays really big sticks and he he, he kind of doesn't look like he hits that hard when you see him play but he hits really fucking hard yeah yeah and so he sound he, he just sounds he's one of those guys as well like i would say like myself as a drummer like he actually sat down on the drums and had a listen to what was coming out of the drums and saying like yeah this is a good sound and if i hit it this way it sounds cool which i think a lot of metal drummers don't have um I think they just sit there and just play single strokes as fast as they can as they can and and it's not like they don't worry about tuning but it's like the way the way you hit the drums is so important and 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 Walt that he definitely he definitely has that he just he sounds very good yeah which obviously makes your job and your life easier and more fun <laughs> yeah of course so speaking of tuning I I have this suspicion that you aren't a fan of Auto tune, would that be right? No, I never. I I hardly know how to use Melody. Because, yeah, I I'm interested in what you think about all of that. Like, obviously, you aren't like you've just said you aren't a fan of at all. But uh, I sing, so I've become. Right. Or and because I'm engineer as well, you become so overly sensitive to every detail of vocals and. Um, I could hear with your stuff like it sounds great, but it's not. I mean, it sounds human still, which I find like is good, is exciting to listen to. It's a, I guess it's a bit of a, it is a fine line between something being uh, good enough and it being slightly out. But uh, how do you feel about all of that? Because I feel like maybe that's another thing where you got to stick your neck out a little bit and go, you know what? That's what he, this singer sounds like, and that's in tune, and. Or it's you know it sounds awesome in the mix or whatever. Like, what do you think about all that? I think it's um, it's all really about the the delivery and the performance. Yep. If you listen to Nick Cave and if you listen to Tom Waits, they sound they sing out of tune sometimes. Mm -hmm. And and but the delivery is there. So to me, that's more important than things being you know like if someone gives me an amazing take where you just really really feeling it then i rather keep it that way um and that you know that applies to any any instrument um and and the voice um i do i mean i don't really use uh melodyne melodyne's the only plugin i use for that yeah. uh, and don't really use it that much like it's more like um if there's you know like a like a harmony that's sounding a little bit off and or you know like someone's really struggling with just getting that tiny little bit you know like and then the right pitch um but generally no uh it's really not i'm more about recording um capturing performances than you know than just bits of vocals in 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 a grid you know, edited to shit and auto tune to fuck because that doesn't. I mean, sure, you can make it sound really perfect, but it doesn't have any feel. So totally, I just, I really, I'm really much more into the idea of pushing people to do, to do it right. You know, it's like okay, well, if you can't sing that, then let's change it a bit. Let's just change the melody a bit, or let's work it a different way because. If they can't sing it like that in the first place, then what are they gonna do live? Hundred percent, and I reckon that I re I believe that recording the vocals real, like how they are sung by the singer, doing their best shot. Um, if, if it's not, then smashed quantized with auto tune. I think it closes the gap between what the band sounds like on a recording and what they sound like live, which I think is I think is a good thing as well. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean it's like um if you if you I don't know. I mean with singers it's always tricky because sometimes they can be like, "Oh, I don't feel that well or I'm I'm not in the mood today and all this kind of crap, which is annoying, <laughs> but um we've all been there. Um 
But I think, you know, I I think I think with vocals is really it's probably worse than any than any musical instruments because I think uh singers I really think that singers are born. Um I mean you can get pretty good, but I mean I have some people I, I've known some people that like, I'm from a family of musicians and my mom is uh she's a she's a pretty important singer in Colombia. And I've heard her sing all my life and her brothers and sisters and yep. you just see these people and it's like wow. I mean like they just sing. They don't have to warm up or or nothing. They just, you know, like Matt from Grave Pleasures is like that. Just gets in and does it, you know. Uh right. Ben from Orange Goblin, right. he just gets in and does it. Like Ben is like insanely fast at recording. Yeah. Wow. And he's singing, you know, he's not like, he's not screaming, he's, he's singing. He's singing with a gruff kind of thing in his voice, but, and he, and the way he like dubs his vocals and stuff. Uh, Chris Rigg as well from, from uh, Over, he's amazing. He just gets in and gets on with it. Right, yeah. Um, his, his, his voice is like, I, I love his voice. It's absolutely, you, you could listen to it all day. <laughs> yeah. And another guy that's actually ama- like like crazy amazing to to listen, you know, like cause I, we're good friends. Haven't worked with them, but we're very I'm very pally with uh, some of the Anathema guys. Oh yeah, most definitely, yeah. And yeah. Vincent is just is just an incredibly amazing singer. Like he's just so good, and he's got so much power to his voice. And I tell you what, like from your neck of the woods. Mm. I was at a festival in Barcelona uh, last year called B-Proc, my friend. Yes. And there was an Aussie band called... Oh, I'm so shit with names. Um, oh, I'm so terrible with names. Oh, what, they are from... What, what, type of, what type of music? They're kind of proggy. They're from Brisbane. Um, uh, From Brisbane? But heavy. From- Caligula's horse? Oh yeah, Caligula's horse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was them. Yeah, man, that guy can fucking sing. Like he's so good. Definitely, definitely. Yep, a hundred percent. And they're they're tight as well. Like they. Like, yeah. You could record those guys, at, like just set them up and record them, and it would I'm sound like live. a finished album. <laughs> yeah, I um, I I saw them at, at this festival, and they were all really good. But uh, but when I um. When I saw the guys backstage, I was like, I was like, dude, you, you, you really, you can't really fucking sing. Like, hats off. Like, he's so good, that guy. And he, he teaches as well. Like, he uh, teaches. Oh, good, he should. Too. Yeah. You know, I, if you could get hold of those guys to record them, that would be awesome. Because a lot of those, uh, yeah, there's a lot of bands that are really cool. But th- when they have like a stale type production or or a super polished production where everything is completely not gridded but really it might as well because everything's so polished and it's so um regimented um Mm. i'd literally rather hear a desk tape where it's a balanced mix and it's just the band playing like that would be so much more exciting um and uh i can think quite a few bands where they would i would love to hear like just the band playing like the like a real recording where they've just done it uh, back to basics if you want to call it that but you know just the real deal yeah yeah i mean that's if you know if you have a band where people are that good you know it's actually it's so much fun um uh to to do it that way because you just you just concentrate on on getting like um just like a nice vibe because you know Mm. even when they're even when they bring their own instruments they usually sound good you know, like they they have like really good drums, and the drummers will be really clued up on tuning, and yeah. they will have nice cymbals, and the guitarists will have nice nice guitars, and like a really clear idea of what kind of sound he wants, and and um, uh, yeah, those when bands are, are are really really good like that, it could be really fun, but it's also hard sometimes to get them out of that shell of like, oh well, it doesn't sound like the new Periphery, and it's like, well, but you're not Periphery, you know, and that's right. I think I mean I think uh, I think Nolly is uh, he even though I I really don't like uh, that music like I, it's not I don't like it I don't understand it I'm very old school with music, um, 
I think he's excellent, that guy. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it just gets... Uh, gets uh, you know, like all these bands kind of sounding the same. Definitely. You know? I would love to see a band, like, I don't know, like Leprous or something like that, just with like a super fucking raw sound. That would be amazing. That's what I was, I was just about to say. Leprous just played in Adelaide like about two weeks ago. And honestly, everything... They're insane. The drums, the drummer, like his drums, what they sound like and him playing them, the, the entire band was just incredible. Like they were, like, they crazy were amazing. Good. Yeah. Mm, they so, are. They're another one. Yeah. But, uh, we'll see. Uh, Maybe I should drop them an email. <laughs> you should, I think. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the fairly recently you ended up remixing believe in nothing by paradise lost and also remastering or and remi remastering it and then remastering host as well so if i start with yeah yeah so if we start with believe in nothing i mean that i guess the production of that album to my ears was sim a sim like sort of a symptom of its time and of um um yeah all of that but uh what was your process like with well, i haven't actually heard your version of it but like what did you do to um, make it what it is now? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the, you know, like with the original mixes. Um, uh, exactly, uh, you couldn't have described it better. It's a, it's a, product, a product of its time. Uh, I think the production is actually kind of pretty cool. Um, but uh, it was the one record that, uh, because, you know, PL... They they've had really good sounding records mm -hmm. always. Yeah, uh, and that was the one that they they weren't happy with the with the mixes. I mean, and and they 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 got John Fryer to do that, who works with you know he's famous for working with Depeche Mode. Yeah, and I think the album sounds sounds cool, but it just I don't know. I just basically made it like a bit more how could I say like more rocking, more bandy than electronic if you know what i mean um yeah so so the original recording of the drum sounds i imagine they would have been like great um did you end up doing did you end up mostly using the original drum sounds and just mixing them differently or did you add samples and stuff in or uh, i mean the recording of the whole album was a bit weird yeah if i tell yeah. you yeah because okay. i mean uh, obviously, um, I have a lot of respect for for John Fryer, mm -hmm. um, but I I imagine that maybe at that point he was maybe thrown out a little bit of of his depth. I suppose I don't really know. And although it it does work, it, it it's it's really hard to describe. You know, like everything in the recording sounded good, but if you try to like mess with it it sounded weird it was just you know like when you for example you get um you're marking up a guitar a, a guitar a guitar cab and you just have like your 57 yep. and then you dial your tone and then you decide like oh i'm just gonna add a little of like a little bit of high mid to this sound and you would do that with that with those recordings and it would just sound so strange like i don't know how to describe it um it's like it was very well recorded but like for like not to be mixed as a kind of uh, like a metal record you know so it was it was very challenging actually i spent a lot of time working on that record um yeah right from uh just just digging out the multi-tracks was very very difficult and just kind of making sense of all the all the all the multi-tracks and we kept on getting stuff like the stuff that was missing and missing tapes and that alone took a long time to, to sort out and yeah but uh then then what i did was just i just made it more i guess i made it sound a bit more more rocking in a way which is kind of what they wanted i mean the 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 record sounds very good the original but it's i guess it kind of sounds a bit weak to today's standards and it's not very kind of too guitar oriented i would say i don't know i just made it i just did my thing and sent it to the guys and they liked it so mm. but the recording was 
was weird. For example, oh, actually, yes, I remember now. The drums were a fucking nightmare. Oh, yeah? <laughs> okay. Because um, they recorded everything separately. Separately? Like, yeah, so the, dr- the, the kick and snare were recorded, and then the toms, and then the cymbals. That's like full 80s style. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and then I had, of course, you know, there were no room mics because, I mean, they if you're going to record three different sources, you know, you're going to, if it's not going to work. Or maybe it could, but it's, it's just weird. And and I'm all about the room mics with drums. Um, yes. Yep. But, he had, but, but they had printed some, some, uh, some TC electronic reverb as the, as the room mics. So... I, it, it was a bit tough with the drums because they, to me, they sounded so unnatural. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was that I was just I was, like, "Fuck! How can I make this sound a bit more like like a dude playing drums rather than?" Yeah. You know, I don't. It was it was it was tricky. That was one of my questions I was going to ask. Actually, if you somehow tried added some room sound to the drums, like I, I don't know. I mean, obviously you can re-room drums it, theoretically as well if you play them through a PA and record down the hallway or something, you could uh, get some kind of a room illusion coming in. But Yeah, I've done, I've done that before. I did it recently, actually, with another project. Um, and um, it, you can, but it still sounds weird. Yep. You know, it's just, it still sounds like, like a, you know, I don't know. It's like a, like a very realistic reverb rather than, I don't know. It, it's, mm. it was weird. Interesting. And so um, with Host, I, I'm sure that would have been a really exquisitely crafted mix. So you would have, I'm guessing so anyway, you would have just had the uh, stereo mixes, mix downs to master from? Yeah, that's all I had. The, the mixes, which, uh, I mean, the, the mixes on that, again, you know, it's a record that sounds, I think that record sounds excellent. Um, yeah, it's yeah. it's perfectly produced for that time. Um, the mixes were so good, like you know, like so 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 good. The mixes on that sounded great. And was there still some again? St- sorry, was there still some space for mastering with the with the host thing? Um, not an awful lot, but just about enough. Yeah, um, because it's like every frequency has been taken. It's been like the the use of the space of the frequencies where it was so good on that album on that on those mixes um but again, I think it just kind of sounded a bit like uh, you know that kind of really digital kind of nineties vibe, so I worked it on tape and you know gave it some kind of analog love and and uh, I think it sounds pretty cool it's it's got a, a slightly different vibe to it it's it's a bit fatter and a bit fuller. Yeah, I just heard the first track remastered. Oh, right. Yeah, remastered. And I I could notice, I mean, I've only listened to it on my phone with earphones, but I know that, I know the original album like ridiculously intimately well. So I, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a copy and having a good listen to it. I'm really super looking forward to that one. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a bit fatter in the, bottom end and all that type of thing yeah yeah not so much i didn't focus on that so much i just wanted to just give it a bit more life you know right um yep i just kind of kind of had that kind of plastic to the two dimensional thing to it a little bit um so i just kind of worked more on that than more than anything else um i think it's more vibey and yeah some songs they have it depends like every song is completely different production or or very different in 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 the album, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, some songs, you know, like I would like say like boost some bottom end, and it would sound terrible. Like it just wouldn't work. Like the bottom end that was there, uh, is being used to like the to the max that you could use it. Yeah. Or it just wasn't yeah. like I don't know. So I just worked every track differently, like one by one, obviously, and kind of did my thing. And again, like the guys were pretty happy. I'm pretty happy with it. And but yeah, 
it's uh it's it, it was uh, i mean it was a really really well done record anyway it sounded really good so that was it was actually reasonably challenging to remaster as well then yeah because you know like sometimes like with something that sounds that good um you feel like okay well what am i gonna do with this it already sounds great and there's always a temptation to start like doing lots of stuff yeah but you're you know if it's not broken don't fix it totally um so uh you know i just i just kind of worked more on the actual vibe and i mean yeah it sounds it sounds fuller it's like a like a bigger sounding like has a bit more depth as well um and um you would have done obviously a the vinyl master as well. I don't think that album, I don't know if that originally ever is it came out on vinyl. Do you know if this is the first vinyl release? Yep. I think it's the first one. Wicked. Yep. Yeah. I think, um, believe in nothing. I think someone did it. I think there was a license at some point. Right. But I, I think host never been out on, on, on vinyl. So that's going to be pretty cool because I, yeah, definitely. Like the like the the vinyl mastering I did for it, I'm pretty confident it's gonna sound very very cool. And I think, you know, the fans that have been collecting their their records, you know, are gonna be happy to have the the vinyl version in in their collection. Yep, I'll probably be one of them. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. So actually, on that point, is there? It's a different master on the vinyl than the CD, is it? Yeah. Yep. And is yeah. there a, is it a different master again for the streaming or whatever? Yeah, the, um, it depends. Like uh, some labels ask for the masters for iTunes stuff. Mm. Um, some labels don't. Um, I generally uh, just um, I so I send my like you know like the whatever digital like say like this the cd master i would send that in 24 bit waps to the label and they tend to use that but yeah some labels like nuclear blast they'll they'll ask you to do to do masters for itunes and you have to be a master for itunes certified studio and all this kind of crap um, yeah yep yep but um it's not di it's not different like frequency wise or anything uh the streaming to the actual digital version yeah. Um it's just more to do with the loudness. Um it's yeah, so so is the is the CD master more compressed than what if you were just going to listen to it yourself for your own enjoyment how far you would go with it? Um no, I mean the CD version would be louder in the sense that I think if you if you listen to Spotify or YouTube and you comp and you play something out of your iTunes in the same computer, yeah. Um, you'll hear that the Spotify version is gonna be a lot quieter um, because they have their own codecs, which you know, just to try and keep everything a bit even throughout the the whole library of Spotify. And they have codecs which I think they drop stuff to like minus four, something around there. Right. And you. Uh, where, yep. But without obviously without without compressing compressing it more to I mean there is a degree of compression obviously but it's more it's it's like file compression it's not actually like a limiter just pushing um squashing four dBs down you know yeah yeah so also I'm interested in when did you when did you actually move into your super deluxe studio that you're in now um, I, uh, I think the first, the first client I had there was Grave Pleasures, which was just before Paradise Lost. And that was in March, like mid March, mid March last year. So yeah, about a year. Oh, far out. So it's not very long, really. No, not really. And I know you've uh, gone to pretty incredible lengths to make that studio what it is, haven't you? Like it needed a lot of work, right? Yeah, I mean it's a it was it's an old building. Um it it had some some rooms inside that needed demolishing and it it had a, like a flat ceiling and I wanted to like just 
like you know like have like a vaulted ceiling because of course again the more height I have the better and it was uh it was a very stressful and very expensive project <laughs> but uh yeah I'm really pleased yeah. with it so uh, I think that's worked out pretty well and the bands my, my clients are very happy you know like bands that work, that work with me in my studio in London or yep. any other places you know they still they they've they've been very positive about working here so uh, in particular your control room did you was there quite a lot of thought that went into creating the control room acoustics and the for how accurate it was going to be and that type of stuff yeah i've i've um yeah i got a, i have a friend in colombia that uh he's an acoustician so yep so he gave me a lot of advice with the with the design you know i gave him the measurements and and uh he advised me do this do this do that do that do that and you know we kind of made the middle but um again you know i've i've come from this background that I had to work in so many shit rooms that I just kind of get used to whatever I have to work kind of thing. As long as I have my my barefoots, I guess I can just get used to it after just basically sit there and just listen to all the records that that you love and records that, you, that you've worked on and just kind of get used to sound of the room if you, ha if you have no option. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the... I think a control room sounds sounds really cool. Um, I don't really like dead, dead anything. Dead rooms in particular is you know never been a thing for me. Like dead control rooms, dead live rooms. So, I mean, of course it's very controlled, but it's not it's not one of those like walking into space kind of control rooms. Yeah, and do, I I don't know if I remember correctly. Did you end up making your own acoustic treatment? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah. Yeah, I did uh the quadratic diffusers um and all the um, and all the panels, all the Rockwell panels. Um the diffusers are <laughs> very laborious and time consuming, but they were kind of fun to make. Um I had that like in the summer I had I took some time off because the weather was nice here in the country and and uh, just, you know, I was just sitting there, like, drinking beers and chopping wood, and it was nice. <laughs> but yeah. after making, after making, like, I don't know, I think I made, like, 12 of them, I was like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> they're they're very time-consuming to make. They're very laborious. And and the panels, you know, like, you can just look, the, the absorbers, you can just look that up online and on YouTube. There's lots of different ways of making them. They're, they're a lot easier. Yeah, so well, the things that you were making was that, did you say that was a uh, diffuser? Yeah. So um, it, it had to be uh, mathematically worked out for the room, for the actual room that you're in, or just is it like more of a, was it more of a generic uh, thing you were making? No, it was like I looked at the, <clears throat> at the, at the, uh, the BBC kind of QRD diagram and how to make it and it tells you it's effective on you know it, it tells you what you know what what length of wood you need to make it work in certain frequencies so I made the ones that I needed for for the for the frequencies that my friend advised me to use them for so yeah I mean it's not like um I haven't been with a like doing like a full analysis of the acoustics and stuff, but like, I'm just kind of one of those guys that like, um, I just, I just go and I sit down, and if it doesn't sound right, then I know what is what it is that it doesn't sound right. Oh, there's there's too much like two and a half to like five k. Just then, just get a trap that does that, and put them, move them around, and see where it sounds good. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean. I don't know. I'm just a bit. I'm a bit like that. <laughs> I just like doing, doing things. Uh, instead of looking at numbers and computers and stuff, I just kind of sit there and go like, mm. you know, like uh, recently, actually went a bit overboard with the bass trapping, which is, which you you think is never possible. Um, All right. What was the what was the effect of that though? Something you didn't like or? Well, it like it sounds. The room sounds great, but like I just. 
um, I think I was very used to my room in, in London where I, where I had a, a serious problem with the bottom end because I had too much of it. Right. And, right. and then I moved to this one and I have like not a lot of it. Um, so I got a sub and, and the subs has been great, but you know, it's just, um, I keep on telling my assistant like, oh, like we need to move it back a bit and see what that sounds like, or like move it forward a bit, or just move it to a side, you know, you really have to, ex you, you, I don't know, you just move it, just move things around until they sound right, or, you know, you can always go the route of spending, I don't know, 10,000 Australian dollars in, in a guy to come and do an analysis and, and sell you all this stuff, and then sit there and go like, oh, sounds a bit weird. Most definitely, yeah. Well, and I mean, the... The I guess the bottom line is the results speak for themselves. Like uh, by the process of you listening to what things sound like and being familiar with your room and that type of thing, you're getting the results. So that is the bottom line, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I mean, it's of course I'm, I'm not I'm not dissing, you know, like uh, like like looking into acoustics or saying that yeah, you you can just mix in in any shitty room. No, not at all. <laughs> but you know, you have to have some degree of. Uh, of of acoustics in the room at least you know and and then and then just sit there and and go like right okay like as I had it in the studio I just I just you know it's been changing uh in the first kind of six months it the acoustics changing there because I I felt like mm, I'm getting too too much of this or I'm not getting enough of that and you know slowly slowly you kind of you tune it to your ears I suppose mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's more of an intuitive approach than uh, just deciding you're gonna pour a mountain of cash into it and have someone else fix your problems. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's cool. uh, sure. If you if you have the money, you know, and stuff, it's of course it's it's cool. But um, I don't know. I I just kind of think like if I get someone to design me a a control room and spend lots of money on it. And then I just sit there and I just go like, oh, I don't like it because you can't like you can't build it in steps. Like you have to hire someone and do the whole job and then listen to it. Yeah. And then how about if you go like, eh, actually, <laughs> it's yeah. a bit too dead now. And it's like, well, that's it, because <laughs> I don't know. Cool. Well, that's in that's really interesting. It's not actually necessarily what I thought you were going to say because i know you've spent a lot of money on getting your studio really beautiful and it looks amazing you've got this great gear but uh you took a intuitive approach with getting the sound in the room i guess that makes sense because it's, uh, cause it's uh, yeah i mean i've i've, kind of I've done it in every work. in every studio that i that i that i owned or that i rented before you know i i've always done the same i just go in the room and i set up the speakers and i listen and and then just kind of start, okay, well, let's start with this and then have a listen again and and then just kind of tune in as you go. I mean, there's so much stuff you can make yourself these days and you can make it look pretty cool and very pretty pro. Yeah. You don't need like a lot of tools, you know, like... And there's so much info available now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, on YouTube, there's like a, a millions of... <laughs> probably a million videos on how to make acoustic stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. As long as you buy like the right materials and you do a bit of research on, you know what what's the, the absorption mm. or and the or the diffusion on which frequencies and stuff they're they're working on, then it's pretty cool. It's just you just do your own. Yeah. Yeah. And is there any dream pieces of gear that you don't have that you one day would like to get your hands on? Hmm. All the drum kits, all the guitars and amplifiers in the world. <laughs> More than any kind of compressor, preamp or, yeah, I really, uh, it's really, for me, it's really, really going down to, I mean, it's, I think the source is definitely the most important. And, and, yeah. and you know, and have yeah. the, and have like a, like a full palette of, of like, right, I want this song to sound with this guitar tone and this drum sound and and this kind of bass tone, I, I would love that. Just literally have like like two hundred guitars and two hundred drum kits and just kind <laughs> of 
yep. pick one, you yep. know, it will be that. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of what I what I see myself spending more money uh, one day. Yeah, because uh, I, in terms of microphones, do you have a U forty seven? No. Oh, because I I couldn't remember. I saw a few videos from your studio with people singing, and I couldn't remember what the what your have you got like a favorite vocal condenser that you have or well i have i have a pair of u87s right okay yep and um and i have i have some really like really early c414s akg c414s that have the the ck1 brass capsule okay and those things how they sound better than any condenser i've I've got so a lot of the time I end up using those for vocals too. Cool. Yeah. And do you use them on the drums? Yeah, they always they they're often on either as overheads or room mics. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And so there's no other bits of esoteric outboard gear or um, microphones or anything that you want to get hold of? Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I I, I think I'd like to. You can all you can always you 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 can never have enough microphones. I think it would be nice to to get a bunch more mics. Maybe um, I like ribbon mics a lot. I would like to get another pair of uh, of Coles forty thirty eight because yeah. I really really like them yeah and um yeah i wouldn't mind to get like some some kind of one of those pzm mics to maybe stick in the in the ceiling in the in the like in the pitch of the ceiling that could be quite cool maybe and i mean there's always bits you like you know that i that i'd like to buy and then i get friends you know like oh have you tried this mic and like a friend of mine like last year told me um do you have a Beta 91? And I'm like, that flat mic thing. And he's like, yeah. I said, no, I don't have one. He said, get one. I'm like, why? He's like, just get one. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I got one. And I mean, I trust this guy really well. And, and I actually really like that mic for for a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's what they used on the Black Album. Or what, well, one of the things for the kick drum sound on the Black Album was that mic, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be, it can be, it depends on the, obviously on the, um, on the drum and the skin, but it can be like this. It doesn't have to be clicky. It can be like like a nice kind of snap to it as well. But I really like the the low end, like the sub that comes out of it is kind of what I'm more interested on. Yeah. I really, really yeah. like that. Yeah. It's like really, it's really thick and something about it that I really like about that mic at the moment because I'm always, you know what it's like when you do this, you're, you're always changing. You're falling in love with a, with I don't know like M two hundred one on the snare and then you put a fifty seven and go like oh wow fifty seven sounds amazing and you go back to the fifty seven and then you get bored of it go back to the M two hundred one yeah so now I record yeah. both yep and and uh, are there any uh, are there any other projects you've got coming up this year that you're allowed to talk about um or anything uh, anything you're excited about that's coming up in your world. Yeah, there are a few exciting things. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about them yet. I think, well, the the first the first exciting thing that I have coming up for sure that um that I can talk about is uh, the new Hex Vessel yep. album, yep. which is um they're a Finnish Finnish band that I've been working with from from day zero pretty much. So um, I'm really excited about this one because we're we're going back to to like the first album and it's gonna be more a lot more folky kind of folk based than than kind of 60s garage rock like the last one um yeah right so i'm really excited about that because um you know i really feel like i'm part of that band and and i i can have a lot of creative input and i you know, I already got the demos and I've been listening to them and I'm already bouncing ideas off with the with Matt, the singer, and mm. it's it's really good fun. Sweet. I haven't heard those guys, but uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I probably will at some point in the future. So Cool. Um, 
Oh, the last thing I had was people saying, oh, you know, there's no future for big studios and all this kind of stuff now. But I think you have a nice big studio and you are doing like, you know, working and doing great stuff and getting jobs and all that. So um, what do you think about the future of big studios? Because it's not an insignificant investment and all that type of thing. So obviously it can still work. Yeah, I mean, like, what are you going to do? Just record everything in bedrooms and use reverbs. Like, fuck that. Like, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, and then they're, they're, send it we, to we're the... Gonna, yeah. you're, you're gonna need You're going to need at least, like, one or two fucking studios with a big live room. That sounds good because basically any acoustic instrument is just going to sound like shit in these tiny little places where people are recording. Or, I mean, yeah, the future yeah. of music is not... It's not uh, it doesn't go one way. It, it's not going to be you know, periphery samples with uh, periphery patches, you know? Yep. Um, no, because, you know, there's still bands that want to record live and they want nice live rooms and, you know, they want strings and pianos and stuff like that. And, you know, they want to sound like, like a real band. And yep. I mean, it's tough, but it's, uh, it's uh, there's a market there, you know? Uh, I think as long as you, you know, I, I always have like a, like, like my working ethic is to, always try to make the, the, the next record better than the last one in one way or another, even if it's a completely different band, yep. Um, yep. completely different sounding style. Um, I think if you do a good work, uh, like if you, if you work well and, and, and you work hard and you also keep like good relationships with the bands and because you know, like you, like you don't want to spend like three, four weeks in a studio with an asshole. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So oh, is that? Yeah. So yeah, you you um. Of course, you know it it helps if you get along and, you know, it's all it's all. I mean, like for me, it's also like it's uh like working here is part of the experience. You know, it's not like you just come to my studio and and we record and that's it. You know, like you come here and we're gonna be hanging out a lot and we're gonna be, you know, like barbecuing stuff in the summer. Um, We'll be maybe having a couple of beers at night and listen to mixes or like, you know, just, just, it, I think it's good too. It's like, I, I like, I like to kind of offer like an experience as well. And I think that way you get the best, like the best performances out of bands, you know, if they're somewhere where they're comfortable yeah. and they're having a nice, a nice time and there's a, a positive attitude in the air, then you're going to most likely going to get a good record out of them. And plus, uh, I think people need to remember that um, music, I don't, I don't know, I've seen heaps of young guys, players and bands now who uh, can play their instruments very competently and bands that like they're all playing the right thing sort of pretty much at the right time and all that kind of thing. But there's something to be said for having band chemistry and having like a, a vibe where everyone actually rehearses in the same room and everyone hangs out and that definitely directly translates into the music as well. So I think that's wicked. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's uh, stating the obvious, but I mean, it seems to be a bit lost on some of the younger, some of the younger musicians, coming up. musicians coming up. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, a lot of, I mean, there's the, we're, we're on the bedroom generation now, I guess, of musicians where you basically get, get kids going on, on YouTube and... Um, and they just kind of sitting in their bedroom learning all this stuff really quickly. And but, um, you know, um, it's not really the point, is it? <laughs> I, I I really wonder if you know if I got like one of these kids that is really fucking shit hot playing guitar, and I go like, all right, dude, let's. I'm gonna set up my kit and we're gonna have a jam. Yep. And I think they'll be like, uh, well, uh. I don't know where to start. Like, where's the click track? And, you know, <laughs> or like, I don't know what to play, whatever, you know? Um, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, of course, I mean, to me, to me, music is about that. I mean, like when you're, when you're not, when you're not doing that, that stuff with music, then uh, I don't, I don't, I don't care about your band, you know, like music is about emotion and, and, you know, and I don't really see this, com this computer music stuff, this super proggy, or those death metal bands with like, you know, 
super boring kind of blast beats all the way through at 260 BPM and stuff like that. It's like, I just find it really boring. Like, um, I just like, I just like, you know, like 70s records, you know, like people playing stuff. Yeah. Strangely enough, people playing music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Funny that. Yeah. And um, and then you just, you know, use the technology as a, as a tool to, to help, you know, to, to enhance that. But I mean that fundamentally what it should be is, um, just get people to play, play together. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been absolutely a pleasure having a chat and, uh, we're coming up to about an hour and a half. So, um, yeah, what can I say? I've got to, I've got to have more practice at how to sign off on these things, but I appreciate you having a chat and I've, I feel like, um, everything you're saying resonates very much with me and with the way things should be done, you know? So, uh, yeah, man. That's cool. Yeah. Man. yeah no, I, like, thank yeah. you so much for, for having me in your, in your podcast and, um, I yeah, hope no uh, your listeners don't 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 find my blabber too boring. I very <laughs> much doubt it. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's very cool, and uh, I'll be keeping an eye on your work, and no doubt there'll be more stuff in down the track that is going to be exciting to be checking out from your camp. I would say. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Um. You know. Um. Any time, like if you want to do another interview at some point, just uh, yeah, definitely. If there's any yeah, questions definitely. you got about anything, um, you know, or even if some of your listeners have questions about stuff, just uh, just let me know. You know, I, I like if I, I I like I like I like you know sharing what I do as well, and because I guess like especially working with metal bands, I think I probably work in a very unorthodox way to today's standards because hmm. i mean I, i'm still working on tape for fuck's sake <laughs> like yeah. i think no one's doing that in <laughs> in metal stuff so i don't know but yeah of course i'm uh it's been a pleasure and uh if i can help with anything just let me know yeah and if people want to get in touch with you they can find you on facebook pretty easily can't they and uh, yeah that's uh, that's no problem i mean like if i if i don't reply in two weeks don't get offended because i mean i do have a lot on at the moment yeah i do try to to reply to most people and i enjoy talking about you know like production and stuff so it's all cool wicked and if people want to check out your studio i think it's is it orgon studios dot dot com or dot net or no dot com yeah i dot mean com. actually there's a there's an Instagram for Oregon Studios as well and yep. and a Facebook page as well. I think that might be actually easier to contact me through there. That's cool. For I'll like put music cool. stuff. Yep, I'll put all that into the show notes. Everyone can find that and uh, check out what's going on. Excellent. All right, awesome, man. Thank you very much once again and we'll catch you down the track sometime, no doubt. All right, man. Thank you so much. All right, cheers, brother. It's been really See good ya. fun. Cheers. Bye-bye.